I just love it when people try to attack me when I play 1d4. Don't you get that d4 is rock solid and absolutely impregnable? You know what I call a Benoni the Son of Sorrow? Like, you give white all the space. You have the backward pawn on d6. I mean, you've got no counterplay. Wait, what? Can you do that? No, what? You can't do this. Like, this is just a blunder, right? Right? Uh, it's just... White's just winning, no? Man, it's, it's so... So frustrating. Like, I've spent so, so long memorizing this 400-page opening book. You know, learning all the finer details. He just plays like this B5, like these... These kids these days have no respect. They just think they can you know, watch some 60 second video on TikTok and say that a world's leading expert on the topic. Ah. Illingworth Chess, the best to improve your chess. What's up, Illingworth Chess family? So, if you are not part of the Illingworth Chess family, well, we're very happy to welcome you on board. We're all going to learn all about how to learn D4, understand how to successfully improve our D4 repertoire. But before I do that, if you are new to this channel, do make sure to hit that subscribe button. That will ensure that you get my two Grandmaster Chess videos in your feed each day so that you can become a better chess player and also have some fun and enjoy some jokes along the way. In any case, also do make sure if you do enjoy this video to hit smash that like button. And when you do subscribe, write in the comments below, I subscribed! Exclamation mark, so that we can welcome you into community. I do try to reply to as many of the comments as I can. So, it'd be great to have you on board, guys. Alright, so, with all that business out of the way, let's see how we might go at learning one D4. It's worth pointing out, I've actually done quite a few different videos on D4 in the past. For example, I did one on the Queen's Gambit uh, for White, which I've included a suggested video up the top there. So, you can always check that out if you haven't seen it yet. So, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the lines where Black plays Knight 6 because when it comes to D5, like, it's pretty clear that you need a system against e6, you know, the queen's gambit declined, obviously you need some sort of system here. You know, you also need a system against the Slav defense. And finally, you also require some system against the queen's gambit accepted, which is a move that you might face quite a lot amongst, let's say, inexperienced players, but they just think, well, what is this queen's gambit rubbish? I mean, I know I watched a Beth Harmon film, but really just blundering a pawn. I'm going to chow my inner ball off and it'll be game over by my special Russian psych out. But okay, rather than talking about this, I want to focus more on the move order points with knight f6 and how to move c4. Uh, of course, I've done videos on the London, but of course, like, c4 is the critical move. And if you're wondering why we play c4, basically it's so that we can go knight c3 and then play the move e4 and just take over the center. Because if you play knight c3 immediately, black's going to play d5 and you're going to find it really hard to get in c4 or get in the move e4 after that matter. Whereas if we take, like, g6, you're going to kind of see it now... If Black does try to play d5, well, the difference is that with the pawn on c4, we can actually trade our flank pawn for the opponent's central pawn. For those of you who know the Sicilian defense and, you know, that line we go c5 takes d4, this probably will be quite a familiar concept to you. But, I mean, yeah, the idea is we're able just to take the center, you know, put the pawn on e4 and, you know, have that nice space advantage to work with. This gives a pretty good indication of what White is aiming for. It's worth pointing out that Black can play to move e6. And when it comes to building your... Uh, D4 repertoire. I find it makes sense to start by thinking in terms of what do you want to play against this sort of Nimso Indian or Queen's Indian kind of stuff. Because obviously you have the option to allow the Nimso Indian, and I do have a video that I've included above where you can get some ideas of how to play Queen C2 against Nimso like Nakamura, if that's your kind of jig, if you love, you know, those one minute bullet streams and speed runs. But for those of you who maybe want to avoid the Nimso Indian, because Nimso is a pretty uh, dang good opening, well, you can play to move Knight to F3 instead and say, well, I'm going to avoid the Nimso, but I'm going to allow a few other things in turn. For example, I can play to move d5 and head back into a Queen's Gambit decline where you don't have the exchange anymore. But you can still play Knight c3, you can still put the Bishop on f4 or g5 and get a nice active position that way. I mean, there are a lot of options that Black can play to learn. So if you do want to try to force it so that you get your type of opening on the board rather than Black getting their type of opening, well then you might like something like the Catalan, which is something that I have recommended. In some other videos in the past, again, you can check the suggested videos for some uh, good ideas and some good coaching there. Uh, and Black is, of course, not forced to play d5. He does have some other options. For example, he can play the Queen's Indian with b6, and you know, that can lead to some very positional play where Black is going to try to keep control over the, the e4 square with pieces. And well, in that case, like there are different approaches, like you can play knight c3, but that does allow knight e4 and they can try to, you know, trade off the knights and keep a grip over e4. So that's why you'll sometimes see people play moves like rook e1 and kind of play this waiting move 
you know, waiting for him to go D5 before playing your CD5, Knight C3. Or no, even Gambit's like D5 as well for those who want to play a lot more aggressively and directly. Though these kind of Alpha Zero inspired variations as well that you're also welcome to check out. Um, so yeah, and of course another move order point that can be very easy to forget. It's better on Sisters against the Benoni may also vary depending on the move order you play. Because when you play Knight F3, it means that if they go C5, you're basically committed to a modern Benoni where you've got the Knight F3. So let's say, for example, that you wanted to maybe play some stuff like E4 and F4, for example. Well, obviously you can't do that anymore when you've got the Knight blocking the F pawn. But the good news is you do get some other options at your disposal. You know, move like Bishop F4 and try and go after the pawn as a plan that often works quite well. Like lines with Bishop G7, Queen A4. A one where if black is not well prepared, it can quickly end up in a pretty difficult position here. And there are also other strategic approaches like playing Knight D2 and just building a very solid center with E4. Uh, the reason we play Knight D2 is so we don't run into an annoying Bishop G4 pin to pin the Knight. And here you can castle Bishop E2 and... And I mean, if black is able again to move like B5, you, know, you can kind of keep it under tab for a move like A4. Kind of build a very solid pawn chain with F3 and it just becomes very hard for black to do his usual counterplay in his Benoni Son of Sorrow positions, which is one reason why you don't really see a lot of top GMs play the modern Benoni, because objectively it does give White a pretty pleasant advantage if White knows what he's doing. Um, but it's good to know about the move order, because otherwise, let's say, if you'd prepared some system that wasn't with Knight F3, then you could end up being a little move order if you're not careful. So one thing to keep in mind. Uh, now let's talk a bit more about the move G6, because in this game, our hero for White is the player Alexei Serana, who is uh, one of the young Russian talents, a big... D4, C4 expert, right around 2650-ish. And he's playing against Vladislav Kovalev, the top uh, player from Belarus, who's also right around 2650. Uh, and in this game, Kovalev played the King's Indian with Bishop G7. And I've suggested in a previous video that I kind of am sort of impartial to these subs where you play an early Bishop to E3. You know, I mentioned before them in a Koganov line with H3 and Bishop to E3. Give me a somewhat annoying system you know, with H3 to stop the knight coming in at G4. And in the game, Serrano actually goes for a very similar setup, where he, from his tiled Tuesday chess complex 2021, he decided to go for the move bishop to e2. And, well, the difference with this is that, well, it's kind of a similar idea. You know, you're basically still putting the bishop on this nice e3, very flexible square. And you're still stopping knight g4, but rather than playing with a3, you're doing it with a developing move with the bishop, which of course has pros and cons, but it is a line that does prove to be a little bit annoying for black in my experience. Because let's say if black plays a normal King's Indian move with e5, we'll kind of see it in this structure after d5, that it's not so easy for black to prove equality. I mean, you can't really just go for an easy f5 push anymore, because if knight e8, you just go g4, and we kind of see that the f5 push is nowhere near as effective when white hasn't castled the king's side. Those of you who saw my d4, how to play 1d4, 2c4, v already, will kind of know this concept, but it's still a good revision to realize that after takes, takes... And e takes f5 that basically this structure after let's say knight to f3 is just substantially better for white. The rook's going to go to g1. We can put the knight on g5, trade off their bishop with some bishop d3. And just once we get the knight on e4, that bishop on g7 will be completely locked in by the pawn on e5. We can get some beautiful squares like knight e6 potentially could be an idea as well. And it's just very, very hard for black to resist the attack. I mean, often the king's in, like we saw a thing of the stereotype like, oh yeah, king's Indian, black always attacks on the king's side. So what's kind of fun about this system and what really gets the creative juices flowing and gets us all excited is that you're actually you're the one who is attacking on the king side in this line. And even if they don't play for f5, like let's say they go for queen side play with knight a6, I mean you can still go for the similar ideas like playing g4 for example, knight c5, f3 and... I mean the idea of h4, h5 is not so much necessary to checkmate the black king, but you're just trying to make it really hard for him to get their usual f5 counterplay. For example, let's say if they go like h5 now trying to beat it to the punch, we can go g5 and we kind of see that, you know, the f5 break is not really as effective as it was beforehand, because now if they do push the f pawn, we can simply take. And I mean, black's king side is not as good as it might look. You know, if white is able to castle long and get a rook on g1, well, that obviously is going to lead to some annoying pressure against the g6 pawn. White still managed to keep this very healthy pawn chain, so just ultimately a position I do think white does have a quite pleasant advantage here. Uh, so, and there are even other approaches where, like, the computer actually likes the idea of going h4 and going queen c2 and kind of trying to get an h5 in without the preparatory g4, which is also an interesting alternative you might like to explore in your own time, because the engine is very partial to this concept. But anyway, we can kind of see, you know, some of the problems that Black is facing if he plays the usual King's Indian way. And a general principle as well worth keeping in mind for those who are King's Indian players watching this is Black. 
is that if black is not going to go for the move e5, then often the move c5 is kind of a good plan B, like trying to head back towards some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of Benoni type structure or some Rotary bind structure with cd4. Uh, but I think in this position, maybe black could have considered knight c6. I think this is why I recommended my Grandma's Secrets to King's Indian course, which is one I will make sure to put in the description below. For those who want to learn how to deal with these kind of systems and be able to play this dynamic fence to d4, you know, Bob's your uncle, just check the, the link in the description. And the one disadvantage with knight c6 so is you are allowing the move d5, and this knight is kind of getting kicked around a lot with f4. So it's one of these lines where, like, if you analyze it super, super deep with the engine, it turns out that you are technically doing okay. Like, you can go knight h6. You can play c6 and just rip open the center, and you do get counterplay before white consolidates. But, yeah, it's very sharp, and it is true. White position is a little bit easier to play, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so in any case, the game went for the move c5. And, well, Serrano played the move d5. And at this point, you might think, well, okay, Max, when we look at this Benoni type of structure, you know, with knight to f3, e takes d5, and c takes d5, well, you might notice it's very similar to the lines where, you know, where we saw with the knight coming to d2, but where instead of knight d2, we've played the move bishop to e3. And so you may recall that one big difference when white hasn't played knight d2 is that you are giving black the option of playing bishop g4. Because one thing I find is that often in the Benoni, like let's say you play knight d7 as black, for example, what you kind of see is that this bishop ends up really stuck on c8 and really struggles to find a good post because the knight's kind of blocking the way. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the knight's sort of a traitor, but you know, let me out, let me out. I'm stuck as saying behind these church walls, being in prison, having to do my sermons. Give me a real life. And the knight says, what are you talking about? I'm comfortable. Like, you know, just go and, and suck it up, buttercup. But and instead, you know, the move bishop g4 does solve that problem, trying to trade off the knight. And if black does trade off a knight, like, one thing to keep in mind in these pawn structures is that when it comes to a middle game, like, once you've developed all your pieces, you're going to start thinking about how to get in the move e5. Because if we imagine those pawns getting traded, then white would have a pass d pawn that would be really quite strong. I like to call it Delroy the d pawn. You know, kind of like, sort of, when I think of Delroy, a very Scottish name from Jonathan Rousen. And since I'm 25% Scottish, why not, you know, keep the Scottish hope alive? But our bishop g4, we can play the move knight to d2. So well done if you follow this move, by the way. It turns out it's actually better to keep the knight than the bishop because, well, once you end up playing a move like f3, that bishop's kind of going to be stuck behind the structure anyway. So it's one of the rare cases where you're actually quite happy to trade off the pieces when you have the space advantage. You know, if black plays knight to a6, you can just play moves like king h1. And you know, if they go knight c7, you play a4 and you just make it very hard. For black to get in the move b5, you can consolidate the structure with moves like, let's say, pawn to f3, say rook b8, pawn to f3. And in these sort of structures, admittedly, it's not so easy for you to get in the e5 push. You, know, you can play moves like knight d7 and make it hard to get in. But a good plan can be to sort of prepare for a uh, sort of b4 break, which you can often support with knight c4 to put a little pressure on the pawn. Now, to be fair, I'd have to be honest and say I think that if black plays this perfectly, he probably does come quite close to equalizing here. But I still think that in practice, it's a lot easier to play white. You know, white does have the space and black's approach. It doesn't mean more to maintain the balance and to fight for an initiative. So not the world's happiest scenario for a Benoni player either. Uh, I don't call it the son of sorrow for nothing. Uh, but yeah, instead, as I mentioned in the teaser, Black played the move B5. And, you know, B5 would actually be a very good move in this position if White only had the option to take that pawn or to leave it. Because let's say if you play Knight B5, well, then the pawn on E4 would be left undefended. If you play Bishop B5, it actually turns out you can play Knight takes E4 anyway. You know, those of you who played a Benoni, it's a really important tactic to remember that after Knight E4... And queen a5, that black does have the fork. And well, after queen d2. Technically, you are, like, you know, giving black, white the d6 pawn. But you can either go queen a6 and sort of sack the pawn to keep the white king in the center. Or you can simply take that pawn back with queen b2. And you know, either way, black is in very good shape. You know, rook b1. And you have this very forcing line with a little checky check check. And after knight to d2, knight to a6. You know, black's got full play here. You know, Black's going to get his bishop to some square or even a move like knight b4. And just kind of liquidate the center. Because it makes sense that in a brain that Black is aiming to blow up the white center. So that he can release all the latent energy of his pieces. This is why people like Mihal Tal were very successful with and loved to play the modern Benoni as Black. Because it gave him the chance to get that initiative and to really fight for control of the game in a very unique way. Uh, you know, he talked in minor accepting the positional weaknesses for the dynamic play. Unfortunately, it is for black in this game, all the dynamic players for white, because white found a really brilliant move of e5. You know, I mentioned beforehand, you know, if you were paying attention, that white's dream break in 
the Benoni is to gain the E5 push. So it's worth asking the question, well, can you just get in the E5 move anyway, even if it doesn't seem to be all that well prepared? Most of the time the answer is going to be no, but in this case it's a very firm yes. Because if you play a move like Knight G4, for example, trying to do a fork, well, White's got the counterattack with Bishop G5, and that's going to ensure that you're able to trade off that D6 pawn and have a really nice pass pawn on D5 to work with. Or if they do play F6, well, you simply take and... Well, that is now this knight takes e4 shenanigan, so you can simply take the pawn and just be a pawn up, you know, put that one as a deposit in the bank. So instead, black played d takes e5. White played the move bishop takes c5, and now black has a little bit of a dilemma here, that in this case, you know, if you do play a move like rook to e8, which is probably the best move here, by the way, well, white can go bishop takes b5, and you're not just grabbing a pawn, but you're also hitting the rook, and I think that after something like knight bd7, and bishop to e3, or even bishop a3 is also a candidate, in fact, to keep the bishop more active. Uh, either way, I do feel like after even these bishop moves, the black's not really getting enough compensation for the pawn. Like, even if he manages to trade off this bishop, it's still not really putting a lot of pressure on white's position somehow. So, rook e8, yeah, it's probably the best move, just accept that you blundered and you're losing a pawn. But what often a lot of people do is, like, you know, they realize they made a mistake and try to like, get themselves out, like, they try to sweep it under the carpet brush it under the rug and say, you know, it didn't happen, wasn't me, wasn't me. But unfortunately in chess, you know, you are completely responsible for your own results, for your own moves. That's where a lot of that agony comes from for me whenever I lose a game of chess. Like I can't blame the referee for a bad call or something like this. But so uh, black played a move e4, but unfortunately he's digging the hole deeper now. Because now the move bishop takes f8 was played. And I mean, queen takes f8 or bishop f8 kind of just leaves black an exchange down and not really getting enough compensation. So black played e takes f3, and this was, uh, well, this was uh, Kovalev's idea that, you know, he wants to say, well, I'm attacking both the bishops at once. And if white plays a move bishop g7, I've got this little intimate of fe2. You know, do keep in mind that bishop e, after bishop f6 at e takes d1, queen would come with a check there, which is quite important. So in this position, it would actually be black who is winning. But it turns out that what uh, Kovalev had missed in this blitz game is that you can actually just play bishop takes f3 anyway. The reason is that black just doesn't get the time he needs to take that bishop scot free. It turns out he will be paying a very expensive rent. Where after queen to the f8, well, we secured Broadway. We have to move d6 and boom, that rook is in the corner is a goner. So in order to save the rook, black would have to play a move like knight to c6. But then you can simply take the knight. And if we count up the material, we see that, you know, white is up a rook and a pawn for the bishop. And, you know, once you consolidate where move like castles, there's not really... A lot that Black can do to get himself out of this sticky situation he's found himself in. So he played a move B4, continuing to try to hustle, but unfortunately 92 just covers everything. And now the rest of the game is more or less just a massacre. You know, those who like blood on the chessboard, who love gladiatorial battles where no prisoners are taken, well, the rest of the game will be fun for you. We had Bishop to A6, White took the free rook, and I think if this was a classical game, Black probably would resign, because White does have two rooks. He's up two exchanges and a pawn, which is just way too much here. We had 95 and, you know, white castles. I mean, the double pawns are not really a significant weakness if black is not able to actually attack them. And we see it with the queen sort of stuck here that black's not really in a position to make the attack happen. I mean, you're quite happy to see bishop e2 because then you get to trade off their bishop pair. So the game ended knight d7, rook to e1. Again, emphasizing the initiative over keeping every single pawn alive. Uh, so after knight g5, we had knight g3. And after knight d3, very precise move at d7. Which was enough to make Kovalev resign here. Because he realised that after knight e4, that e1, that Serrano could even just play queen takes e1, or even a move d8 equals queen. Anyway, like, white is just up way too much material, and it's a pretty straightforward win for white, in fact. So there you have it. That's how to learn the move, uh, learn move d4. We kind of saw how, when learning d4, that when building a repertoire, that there are two main questions basically come up. Which is how you're going to respond to e6, and how you're going to deal... You know, how are you going to deal with this transposition if they play the move pawn to d5? You know, having a system that kind of fits with our usual answer to the Queen's Gambit decline. You know, if they played via d5 and 2e6, making sure that we don't get move order out of our system there. And then the next part is, you know, making sure we have some system against the Grunfeld and against the King's Indian. Well, obviously, I focus a bit more on the King's Indian. And we still had a system with Bishop e2 and Bishop e3 is quite unpleasant, where I can just go for this structure like e5, d5, where we can push the king side pawns. Or go c5, d5, just have a very good version of a Benoni for white. So in any case, that was my explanation of how to learn d4. If you enjoyed this video, do make sure to smash that like button. It really does help me out because it tells me 
what uh, videos to make for you guys in the future. And also comment below, say that you subscribed if you're new and you hit that subscribe button. You know, do make sure to hit it if you didn't already, guys. And also comment, you know, with what you really loved about this video. I do try to answer every comment I can. Uh, that's about all for now. So I'll catch you guys later in the next chess video. And good luck with playing the move 1d4.